All right, next up is Duncan Cruzy. He is a graduate student with Oregon State University. And he will be talking about distribution dynamics of Phytophthora rubi and root lesion nematode in, in Pacific Northwest red raspberry. Hi, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about some research that we've been doing for the past couple of years. Uh, the research we've been doing for the past couple of years on the distribution of Phytophthora rubi and root lesion nematodes in red raspberry fields. So I'm going to start out just by going over some background of why this, why we wanted to do this research, and then I'll go over some of the studies that we've been doing and wrap it up with some conclusions that we have from the results. So raspberry fields are typically replanted every five to seven years, largely due to pathogen pressure, and two of the most important pathogens are these two organisms, um, root lesion nematode or Pratolinchus penetrans and Phytophthora rubi, which causes root rot and red raspberry. The major means of control for these pathogens is um, preplant fumigation with Telone C35. And this preplant fumigation occurs in 95% of replanted fields and 50% of new fields. But how effective it actually is, is not quite clear. Here we can see that in July of 2014, there were very high nematode populations. And then after plant removal, you see a large decrease in the nematodes in September. And then after fumigation in October, we don't necessarily see a large decrease from September. However, following winter, we do see a decrease in populations. But then the f after the following harvest, once again, populations climb back up. So what, what makes this control method function like this and some of the problems that occur? One thing that could potentially be happening is that once plants are removed, infected roots are typically left in the field. These roots can potentially provide a refuge for the pathogens, protecting them from the effects of fumigation and provide a new inoculum source once plants are replanted. There's also the problem of where fumigation occurs, which is typically about 45 centimeters down or 18 inches. Any pathogens located below that are unlikely to be affected. There's also the issue of loss of registered products. Uh, as Tom said, increased regulations like buffer zones. Typically also the system has very little crop rotation, which means that uh, populations can build up quickly. And there's also the issue of no effective post-plant nematicide. So what, for us, the question was, why does the distribution matter? Of why the distribution of these two pathogens actually makes a difference? Knowing when and where these organisms are located can help us target and improve management decisions. So the first study we wanted to look at was how long nematodes actually reside in the roots once plants have been removed from a field. This is important because fumigation typically occurs within two months of plant removal. However, if nematodes are still located within their roots, it might be a place for them to be protected from any fumigation effect. So our objective was just to determine how long the nematodes were actually staying within the root material. So what we did was we collected roots from an infected field, and we collected roots from plants that were both treated with herbicide before they were removed and plants that were untreated. We kept those separate. And we filled up these nylon bags with root material and sterilized field soil, dug a bunch of holes in the ground with this auger, and then buried these bags at about 12 inches. 
And we did this in two different locations. One of them was here in northern Washington, and one of them was down in Corvallis. And once the bags were buried, we collected 10 untreated bags and 10 treated bags from each field every two months. We then collected, processed the roots and counted the nematode populations. And what we found is this. So the initial counts were for the treated roots were around 205 and untreated around 240. So there's a little bit of a difference there. And what we see is we see a large reduction right off the bat two months after burying them. And we see those populations decrease. But what we also see is that we see nematodes surviving in these roots all the way up eight months after they were buried. For the Oregon field, we see a similar sort of pattern. There's a quick reduction and it, reduce, it continues to reduce over time, but we're still seeing nematodes eight months afterwards. This may indicate that the timing of fumigation may allow the nematodes to be protected within the leftover um, root material in the field. So along with this issue of them stay, being protected within the roots, there's also that issue of um, the depth of fumigation. As I mentioned before, it typically only goes down about 45 centimeters or 18 inches. Anything deeper than that isn't going to be affected. So our objective was to determine the vertical distribution within raspberry fields and to do this at three different times within the replanting process to determine the efficacy of fumigation. So what we did was we sampled two fields here in Northern Washington and we collected 10 samples at each date. And those three dates were right before fumigation, right after fumigation, and then again, right at planting. To do this, we used a deep core and we pounded this into the ground using a demolition hammer down to a depth of about three feet or 90 centimeters. And this deep core has these removable plastic sleeves inside it. So once we pull it out, we can pull out that sleeve and get a nice soil core down to about three feet. We then divide those up into about six inch increments or 15 centimeters and then cut those up and separate them and then extract nematodes from the soil. And what we found with this is that from this first field we have a fine sandy loam soil texture and on this graph the blue bars indicate um, nematode counts from pre-fumigation samples. The orange bars represent post-fumigation and the green bars represent at planting. So we see a large reduction in this upper soil profile after fumigation, but what we don't see is any reduction at those lower depths. What we also see is that even at planting, there are some nematode populations still present. For the next field, we have a sandy loam soil type, and we see a little bit different pattern going on. On this one, we see not as very many nematodes pre-fumigation at lower depths. And we also don't see a reduction in this post-fumigation at these shallower depths. So what this is indicating is not only are nematodes surviving after surviving the fumigation process, but they're also surviving at all these different depths, potentially below the effectiveness, the effective depth of actual fumigation. So with all this replanting population studies, we also wanted to look at how 
the pathogens are distributed within fields, um, within already established fields. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the actual distribution of these two pathogens within just within individual fields. And we really wanted to relate those populations to both soil texture and topography. So to do this, we ended up sampling two fields in Washington and as well as two fields in Oregon. And we did this using two different sampling methods. The first sampling method we did on this picture, the red dots indicate sample, sampling locations. We did a grid sampling to kind of incorporate the entire area of the field. And then we did what we're calling a focus sampling, which is where we actually identified a disease hotspot. And from that, which would be the center of that cross, and from that we radiated out in four directions. We went across rows in either direction and then within the row in each direction. And at each of those sampling locations, we collected a number of different data. We collected P. rubi DNA concentration, root lesion population densities. We did a visual root rot disease rating. And we also collected elevation and soil texture. To kind of help visualize this data, we made some maps. This first map here indi is indicating field elevation. So the lighter areas are higher areas of the field. The darker areas are lower areas. And for the next one, the lighter areas indicate lower P. rubi concentration, where darker areas represent higher. And in this picture, it's important to note that these outer areas all look like they're very similar, but due to the wide range of concentrations, those areas all kind of got grouped together and washed out in their differences. So it's important to note that 82% of the samples that we collected were positive for Phytophthora. And along with that, we, can, we also have the visual disease rating. And again, the darker areas are areas of high disease, whereas lighter areas are less diseased. The nematode map for this field was not particularly exciting, so I didn't include it on here. And also to note, this field, the soil texture was relatively uniform, so we couldn't necessarily make any important correlations. Um, but that's just for this one field, so hopefully once the other fields are analyzed, it'll be a little more interesting. So these pictures are fine, but what exactly do they mean? It looks like there might be something going on, but what exactly is going on. So here we have a few correlation graphs and this first one on the top left here is visual disease rating plotted against relative ele field elevation. So as may be expected, we see lower areas of the field have higher, area, have higher disease. The next graph on the bottom left we see nematode populations plotted against elevation. And here it's not quite as strong of a correlation, but we still see something somewhat interesting in that areas, lower areas of the field don't have as high of nematode populations. And this may be due to the lack of fine root material in those areas due to other disease pressures but that's just speculative at this point. The most interesting thing that I think we found is this last graph on the right. And this is Phytophthora rubi plotted against relative field elevation. And here we don't really see any correlation. So what this is indicating is that Phytophthora is, can be found throughout the field. 
but we're not seeing disease throughout the field. We're only seeing disease in lower areas. So this might be indicating is that plants can actually tolerate some level of phytophthora pressure, but due to maybe other conditions like poor soil quality or saturated soils, the plants might be weaker and have a harder time standing up to the actual pathogen. So with all of this, we have some conclusions that we can kind of make about the distribution of these pathogens. And what we're seeing is that root lesion nematodes are surviving in root material well beyond that two month period in which fumigation happens after plant removal. However, in those, in those, uh, in that study, we also saw that treating with herbicide actually helps to reduce those populations quicker than not treating. We also saw that root lesion nematodes can be found at depths below the effective depth of fumigation where they might be escaping. We also saw that those root lesion nematodes can be found directly after fumigation. And where those are found might actually be dependent on soil type. Those two fields had different soil types. So, and as we saw, they had different distributions vertically within the soil profile. And finally, while root rot symptoms appear to be heaviest in the low parts of the field, we're actually seeing Phytophthora present throughout the entire field. And an alternative to just using continual broadcast fungicide treatments, so this might be to do something like alter the topography of the field so that there aren't as many low areas where plants can get, where plants are, have poor soil quality where it's saturated. And so with, the, with those conclusions, there are a bunch of people who helped out with this and all the studies, and I think there are probably a lot of new studies that come out of this, and I think Lisa might be talking about some of those next. And so with that, I can answer any questions that anybody might have. Uh, on your bag test, mm -hmm. uh, did you put those bags with the roots in it? I, I like the idea, but but did you put those bags in in a fumigated field? So and, 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 see, the reason why I'm saying that is, as it say, if you had nematodes coming out of the rootstock, that that uh, 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 then then the fumigated the fumigation that's in the field would then would then kill those that came out. Right. So we actually did these on they were done on fields that were not fumigated areas weren't fumigated where they were we just wanted to see how long they were actually going to stay within the root material is it worth the idea of of, of not another one of your tests to go and end up putting those bags of, of, of the fumigated stock mm -hmm. put the bags in the soil in a in a fumigated field to find out whether whether uh, uh, you you killed any of the ones that come out of any pieces of, of material is there? Yeah, I think that's suggestion. I, yeah, I think that would be interesting. Also, on those fields, we made sure to try and keep the plots weed free as possible because root lesion nematode has a wide host range, so we didn't want them surviving on other plants while they were in that trial. Just as a side note. Right. Is manure also uh, uh, beneficial in 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 in, in uh, slowing down the nematodes? Um, I I'm not actually sure about that. We didn't really look at any kind of applications of that, but we actually had a failed kind of a failed trial where we were going to look at compost and manure, but it didn't work out. So I don't have any information on that.
So we're a little ahead of schedule. So any any more questions? All right. Thanks, Duncan.